and uh, and then in Canada we are going to uh, listen to Miss Andrea Kray. Sorry if I didn't pronounce correctly. No, that's right. You said it right. Uh, Andrea is from the Women Community Energy in Canada. She is an assistant professor, School of Environment and Sustainability, University of uh, Saskatchewan. So, Andrea, you have a floor to show us the great work you're doing there. Thank you for having me. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. And I hope this all works. Can you see my slides? Yes, everything is fine. We, I did from our side here. Okay. I hope you can see the main slide and not the background. So hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm in Canada and um, my name is Dr. Andrea Cry. I am excited to be here today to talk to you about women in community power from a Canadian perspective. And I'm so excited to see my colleagues from all over the world. Um, I, I see you in the contact list and I'm part of the family of the World Wind Energy Association as um, I was a student in their World Wind Energy Institute program. So I've had contact with a lot of you around the world. So I'm saying hello, even though we're not in the same room, it's so wonderful to see you and feel you close. So I'm excited to tell you about what's happening in what I've been involved with as a woman in community power, as a leader in community power, but also in my new role as an assistant professor at the School of Environment and Sustainability in uh, Saskatchewan. So in terms of community power in Canada, what we refer to community power as, we've heard a lot of this with this, the model of the cooperatives, but um, there's more, we, we see it in different ways as well than just beyond uh, cooperatives, but a lot of it does root in cooperatives and that community power does have that ownership model where the collective benefits are shared by the local community, but we also have it extended to our Indigenous First Nations Métis communities as well. It has been used in charities and nonprofits as well as in um, universities and health centers, anywhere we can come together collectively, we can apply this community power model. And of course it has this democ democratic ownership model and it's a process where these local groups are investing in their own communities. And we know that the returns are greater in community power projects than they are in non-community power products projects, especially to the local community. And my own research has shown that as well. So I've always approached these problems in power and in energy and um, with the uh, with the thought that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, created them. And um, my my good um, uh, mentor, colleague and professor uh, at the Brazilian um, uh, Wind Energy Center there, um, Professor Veraldo Feitosa, most of you know him. He also said this to me when I was studying with him there and uh, it resonated very strongly. So we always have to be very creative when we come to power, power projects, especially it, applying them in communities. So we have to think outside the box. So here's a little bit about my story. I finished my bachelor's of mechanical engineering with an aerospace specialty and I worked in the aerospace industry. I traveled the world a little bit after that and uh, that's when my world really opened up and I saw a lot of the global problems we were facing. So I went back to school and I focused in on my grad studies, again in mechanical engineering, but I focused in mitigation of icing problems applied to wind energy and wind turbines. And this took me around the world. I met more colleagues in Japan where I presented my research findings in Australia, Italy. And um, in the same time I completed that work, I started my PhD, which took me on an internship with the World Wind Energy Institute to Denmark and Brazil, uh, working directly with Stefan and, and um, our colleagues there as well in the um, uh, Folke Center in Denmark. So I have a lot of the grassroots training in my work for wind and uh, solar and applications in uh, the Folke Center um, uh, the, the, the philosophy of what we do behind these projects. And so when I came back to Canada, I ended up starting um, my own company called Core Renewable Energy. And Core stands for Community Oriented Renewable Energy. And I still have that company today. And I spent over 10 years working and growing 
renewable energy projects with uh, local communities and farmers so much so that here in my backyard I had two farms that I was helping um, farm groups of over 30 members each and they were cooperatives and we had projects that in wind that were um, beyond the scope of what people thought were traditional community power projects. These were projects that were 150 megawatts each. Um, that would be a total of 300 megawatts of community power that we were working on, which was setting precedent for what we're capable of in community power, especially in Canada. Here we have a lot of space, we have prairies, we can do this. It's not always like this in other regions of the world, but we were really pushing the paradigm of what community power could be. And we showed that it was even more cost effective, that the returns were just as, um, the, the cost of the power was just as competitive as what was coming off um, at the utility. But the problems always came back to the PPA, to the agreements. And of course, within those cooperatives, the community struggles, the tensions that we would feel just on the, the soft skills, the human, the human touch. And what I wanted to really emphasize was that even though these projects were started by men, when their directors came up for um, renewal, they brought in women, which was very interesting because the women were the ones who held the position of the president in these cooperatives for the longest period of time. And it came down to the women being more organized, the women having the skills to put everything together, to keep the notes, to you know connect the dots with the accountants, to keep things rolling, even though they were um, sometimes at a standstill. And this was a very interesting insight because when it got difficult to keeping these projects moving the men were in the field farming and the women um even though they were farmers as well we have dairy farmers and cattle farmers etc uh, uh grain farmers they would still have this business mindset to them all our farmers have this business mindset because farming is a business a huge business here and this is where the wind farms are normally located but it, they relied on the women to really carry through the project so all of my work has led to uh, as well as my research um being in um, microgrids for remote communities and rural and remote electrification um has led me to this position where i am right now and i um in the process became a ted speaker a tedx speaker speaking to this as to how do we empower our local communities to take their renewable energy projects and um, see that economic return to the local level, to the household level. And so this has taken me onto the journey back into academia, where I'm now teaching about this at the University of Saskatchewan, which I'll tell you about later. So I I went on this uh, journey because my why at the beginning of all of this and what set me on this uh, world trip was what good would all this research be if I couldn't apply it. So as an applied scientist, I wanted to see this research be active on the ground. And so I really applied that to um, making and helping these cooperatives get off the ground. And it all stemmed from the fact that um, 1.3 billion people don't have electricity. And, and that just blows my mind. And so when I took this research and I showed that in, in Winnipeg, where I live, um, the urban baseline price of electricity, what we were paying, um, compared to what my neighbors in First Nations in northern Manitoba were paying was 37 times higher, it was uh, devastating and it was revealing that the cost in our northern First Nations in Canada is more than what um, we see in places like the Caribbean, they might be paying 80 cents per kilowatt hour. Up in northern Canada, we're looking at two point five dollars. <laughs> so it's it's substantially more expensive, and it, the poverty issues are huge as well in these communities. So uh, we have a definite need to empower our communities, especially our remote and First Nations and northern communities that face these problems. And we see this in our uh, when I worked in uh, with local community for electrification in um, Nicaragua. This is the island where I did my research, um, Fernando de Noronha in Brazil, where we looked at taking this island to being 100% renewable. And this applies where we see a devastation if it is wherever we are in the world. Right now it's hurricane season and we know what's happening in Central America right now is very devastating. And these areas need to rapidly ramp up their capabilities in powering after after a uh, devastation like this, but we also needed to empower resiliency and um, energy sovereignty in our communities. Otherwise, we can end up with situations like this, which are just devastating. So the data and research show not only my own, but others such as the Toronto Renewable Energy Cooperative in uh, Toronto, they have the first, um, it's a very much a landmark, a wind turbine in uh, when you fly into Toronto, you would see it. 
and uh, they have shown that for every dollar paid to community owned solar projects for electricity, it results in $2 of economic benefit to the provincial economy. And we know that communities benefit from renewable energy generation in very diverse ways, not only from the power they receive, but from their uh, self-sufficiency and the ownership and the pride that they have in that. And of course the local job creation. So the building that I worked on in Nicaragua was able to become um, not only just a, a daylight use building, but now it became, it extended into the evening where with this simple solar panel, they have daylight obviously, and they can have now education for their uh, elders and their community in the evening. We look in our coal communities to convert our snow or our, our schools into um, uh, showing how you can have renewable energy for this for the next generation. So the students are learning not only do they see the buildings, but they take pride in their buildings and they see that um, where their energy is coming from. So we're educating two generations away from where we are so that we can start this movement. We can't just work on um, what I've found in my own work is that it's hard to move right now. Um, a lot of the mindset and the paradigms, it's hard to shift them. But if we start a lot earlier, we may have more hope. And so we also work in, and this is just an example of one of the solar installations in, in our city here uh, that we did um, taking homes so that they are also becoming their own um, power users. And, and this is um, a wind farm with um, many, like a large scale community uh, wind farm. So the reality check though in Canada, and this is when I looked into the data it was quite devastating. So um, it's, it's really upsetting for me to see that in our energy sector, um, in terms of leadership roles, these are the decision makers in our energy sector in Canada, that women, we don't have a lot of uh, position. So we have less than one of five of all leadership roles in, in, in these industries are, are women. And when we look at energy, we see that only 15% are directors and 14% are officers. And we know that a lot of our energy um, cooperatives, they're still, they're corporate structures. A cooperative, no less, is still a corporation. It's just a cooperative structure. So we need to have more women engaged in the electricity sector in Canada. We see here by gender, only 6% would identify with definitely considering a job in the electricity sector. And this is shocking to me. Um, being in the sector. And we see for the negative interest in the electricity sector, 65% women are just not even interested. But when we look to who is positively interested in the electricity sector in Canada, we see it's typically 75% are men. And they're a little bit in the older age group of 30 to 36. Majority of them happen to be in Ontario and have stable full-time jobs in an urban environment. This is not what we expect by definition of women and community power in Canada. So to move this dial, we have a lot, we have a lot of work to do. So the other problem, and I face this personally with my company, when you're investing in um, large power projects, even if they're community or cooperative projects, large, uh, like wind farms are very expensive. You can't just do it as a single farmer anymore. That's why we come together collectively. So you need millions of dollars to do these projects. So we find that VCs or venture capitalists, um, 2% of them are women, like 2% of VCs provide money to female founders. And that was in 2017 and 4% of the deals went to women. So it's very, very small. The women who are getting this, these money to do venture projects that require a lot of money and clean tech and renewable energy projects fall into this category. So female founded companies, when you look at what kind of deals happen, how much money they got, you can see compared to the men in the dark blue and the women in light blue, it's there's a huge, huge difference. And why? And we see who the venture capitalists are. They're mostly men. So men are giving money to men. We need more women who have, um, who can be enabled to become successful enough to become venture capitalists, first of all, to then be able to empower more women. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle and we need to somehow break through this. So in Canada, the, most of the deals happen in Ontario and Quebec, some in British Columbia, and then the rest of the provinces are very, very low. You can see we have layers of data that we have to get through. Um, and this is why we just don't have the answers yet, but we're working on them. And in energy, after seeing messages, women generally become more convinced to join the energy sector. And for indigenous and racialized Canadians, they make up a visible minority of, of the sector that are still eager to work in the electricity sector. Gender it plays a huge role and we need to continue to work on increasing gender diversity and visibility in the workforce so that women can become 
um, players in the community power movement, we need to have min meaningful diversity, equality and inclusion programs are absolutely essential and um, underrepresented groups working in electricity need to be highlighted so that young people can also see themselves joining that workforce and we need to start at a much younger generation if we want to see impact. In terms of community energy projects in Canada, there are several, uh, some of you may know of them, and um, they're diverse, some are wind, solar, biomass, um, run of the river, hydro, but we don't know the role of women in these projects. And we don't know the percentage of women that had an impact in these projects. The data is just not there. We need to continue to collect this information. If we look at what are community power projects in Canada, we see on this active map that is, this comes out of the University of Alberta. They have a map, um, the link is at the bottom of the page if you're interested in looking at it. We see where biomass and solar are. This, this is what all, this is it for community renewable energy in all of Canada. When we look at what include what's included in First Nations, and there's two graphs here, I'm gonna overlay them. Uh, they just, I don't know with this um, map what their difference was, but they show First Nations like this and then like this. So this is showing that we have develop, projects in development with First Nation community renewable energy projects in Canada, which is wonderfully hopeful, it gives me a lot of hope. But still, if you look at all the projects across Canada, this is what it looks like. And you can see that there's still a huge, um, like there's a lot of renewable energy happening in Canada, but how many are actually community? It's very, very small. So we have opportunities and we're trying to make uh, community energy work for women in Canada. And so I wanna tell you about what I'm working on right now at the University of Saskatchewan in the School of Environment and Sustainability. We have a mission in our energy security program. This is a brand new program. We've just soft launched it this year and we're taking in full admissions in fall of 2021 uh, to empower a network of Northern Indigenous remote and career professionals through distance education and purpose-driven practical experience to lead sustainable energy uh, development. So this program in our first year that we've taken in is actually 60% women, which I'm really, really excited about to see so many women stepping up and wanting to make an impact in their community. And in their admissions letters, because I have to go through them all, we read what is driving them. And it always is so moving for me to hear that they want to make change in their communities, especially the Indigenous women. They say, I have to be a leader in my community because in Indigenous communities, it's often the women who make these decisions, who take the lead. And we actually have 50% Indigenous students. So it's, we're making small steps towards making these changes in Canada. And um, just a little bit about the program. It's meant to be a two-year part-time program. It's a professional degree program so that people who are working can still learn about energy security and then be able to, oh, excuse me, of course I'm going to get a call right now, <laughs> um, be able to take this program from wherever they work. So uh, it's again distance and it is remote learning. So you, wherever you are in the world, you will be able to participate in this program and to build teams for life because we know with community power, we need each other. We need to be able to pick up the phone and call our friends in community power anywhere they are in the world, either for just a pep talk to know because this is this is a hard, hard lift that we're doing or to ask some really fundamental questions on how we can fix things. And so it's really important that we continue to build this network, even through conferences like this, that we can get to talk about community power together. And so again, there's opportunities. I can show you lots of them. There's money being thrown at these projects in Canada, but nothing specifies that they're actually funding women. We don't see that anywhere. So I'd like to say that there are opportunities, but we need to fund women and community power specifically and not just um, say we're doing it by the funding that we do. It's great to put it to First Nations, absolutely, but we need to see more specifics on, on women. And I'd just like to conclude by reminding everybody to shine bright, you're brilliant, and the earth is hiring. We are working in this together. Thank you for this opportunity. You can reach me here at uh, the University of Saskatchewan or on my website, www.andreacry.ca. Thank you so much. D'accord, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh... Uh, Andrea, uh, for this uh, great and brilliant presentation.